Good morning, YouTube. Good morning, everyone out there. We will not be leaving anyone out of the good mornings, but an especially good morning to all of those people out there that are working tirelessly, working endlessly in the healthcare departments, whether you're a doctor or a nurse or anyone volunteering and helping out, man, our hearts go out to you. I just wanted to start this video off by saying thank you to everyone that's working so hard to obviously combat what we have going on in our country right now. So hopefully this piece of content can help some people enjoy their day as we are quarantined around the country for the most part. It is Monday morning, so we are talking business. We are talking behind the business of fantasy Football, no player analysis, no coaches, no teams, nothing like that. Strictly marketing, advertising, business, branding, revenue. My guest today, the founder of the Fantasy Football Players Championship, many of you may know as the FFPC. We have Alex Kaganowski. I got that right. Confirmed prior to the video, so I didn't make a fool of myself on air. Alex Kavanowski, co-founder of the FFPC. This is going to be a fantastic episode because he is someone who has clearly built a, uh, a reputable business from the ground up. And we are going into unprecedented times, especially in our industry with what we're facing with the coronavirus. And there are very realistic threats that are upon us when you have to look towards the future and start projecting what you're going to be doing over the next year or so from a business plan standpoint. So Alex, I'm very excited to talk some business with you and uh, welcome to Behind the Business of Fantasy Football. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. This is kind of exciting for me as well. Yeah, man, I'm, uh, I'm pumped because I think we can, we can attack this from a lot of different angles. Um, you know, a lot of the people that I have on here are content creators. They're people that are very active on social media, on Twitter, on Instagram, on YouTube, and things like that. And you are someone that's more behind the scenes, right? You're building this, this business, this brand, this piece of technology, in a sense, while not necessarily making a, a large social presence. And to be honest with you, those are kind of my favorite types of people to have on here because I don't typically get to connect with people like yourself. So with people not having that much of, uh, of a, a full background on you and maybe not of the FFPC, why don't you take us back a little bit and give us a, a quick intro into how you started the FFPC, maybe what you're doing a little bit before that and uh, how it's come to be what it is today. Well, my background had nothing to do with fantasy before I launched the FFPC. I was in a medical industry or medical business, family medical business. Both of my parents are physicians and uh, they have a multi-specialty group in, in Brooklyn. So I was helping to run and manage that facility for many years. And then over time, I was able to launch the FFPC with my co-founder, my partner, David Gerzak. Probably the best way to go back is 2002. It probably precedes a lot of what many of the listeners may know as you know the fantasy industry. In 2002, something uh, called the a world Championship of Fantasy Football was launched by a couple of old school fantasy industry guys, uh, Lenny Papano and Emil Cadlick. And in 2002, they launched this uh, contest, this fantasy football contest, and it was a live event in Las Vegas. Back then, there really, I mean, in, there was internet, obviously, but it wasn't, there wasn't game platforms readily available on the internet. This contest was launched in 2002. You had to fly out to Vegas. It was high stakes. It was, I think, 1500 close to $1,500 to enter, which was gigantic money by, by 2002 standards. I was actually one of the first to sign up for that contest in 2002. And my partner, my eventual partner, uh, Dave, was also one of the first to sign up. And uh, a lot of my customers, a lot of our customers now, the old, the old school customers came from from that contest as well. So the idea, kind of the FFPC idea, was not really the FFPC idea. I, I try to always say, you know, Google didn't invent the search engine, they just did it better. So we, I like to believe that the FFPC did a better version of what WCOFF did back in 2002. But that's kind of where we all got together and started playing high stakes fantasy football in Las Vegas. And then Fast forward to 2008, Dave and I got together along with another partner who had to, uh, Lou, who had to leave uh, our partnership due to other commitments. But at the time, we thought that, hey, you know what, we could probably do something like this, something on a small scale, uh, bootstrap it, like, you know, really, really small without a big investment. And in 2008, we launched the FFPC literally with a couple of thousand bucks and a website, kind of where it started in 2008. Okay. So you guys out of the gate, your initial goal, or I guess, you know, it didn't seem like you had too many future goals with it. You were like, this looks like a good opportunity. This looks fun. Let's kind of just jump right into it and see what happens. Yeah. It wasn't like a major business plan. Like, you know, uh, this is where we want to be in five years, 10 years, whatever. Uh, we kind of, what we knew was 
what the platforms we were playing in at the time, which was the World Championship of Fantasy Football, and there was a couple of other smaller ones already growing as well. What we thought, uh, we, we just simply thought that we could do a better job and we thought we could do, uh, have a better contest with better rules, uh, better customer service, better community. Uh, we just thought we could do a better job, which, you know, not necessarily bigger prizes or anything like that. And that's kind of where we started. Uh, that's, that, that was the plan. Uh, and it was whatever happens, happens. And, you know, if this thing doesn't work, so, we'll, you know, we'll lose a few grand. So when you were starting, like you had these ideas of just doing, seems like you were taking pieces of things that you liked and just turning up the knob a little bit, making them a little bit better. So you had to have created the first website pretty much, right? Like did any of you guys have any kind of like web development background? Like had, I'd imagine the technical side of things was probably the messiest for you guys because the idea is always easy, but implementing it seems to be difficult for the most part. Like what was that experience like? Yeah. So I'm, as far as the fantasy industry goes, I'm probably in the bottom 1% of tech, you know, technical staff people. <laughs> okay. yeah. For sure. It's not even in question. And Dave may be in the bottom 2%. Over the years, I think that's, that's probably gotten, I've gotten a little bit better, but back in 2008, that was the case for sure. So we didn't know, I didn't know what HTML was. I didn't know what any of that stuff was. So yes, we had to hire everyone to do any kind of development for us. So we were mostly, you know, we were mostly idea people, but we also worked like we, you know, we were willing to work and put in the hours and talk to customers and talk to potential strategic partners and, and, you know, really spend as much time as necessary. We were working worker bees, uh, but we really didn't know much. Uh, we didn't, didn't know what we were doing at the time. I, I think the best things start from, uh, from like those humble kind of beginnings, because when, when, when you have the passion behind it, when you have the idea and you have like the vision for what you want it to be, you just figure those things out, right? Like one way or another, you're like, okay, this is our, this is our long-term goal. Like we'll accomplish these 10 steps in between it to get there. We don't know how we're going to do it, but we'll be resourceful. And I actually think that like being resourceful is arguably the single most important trait for someone that's going to be successful. Just the, uh, the ability to like figure shit out along the way, no matter if you're an expert in the, in the process, if you have no idea what you're doing, if you can work hard enough to figure something out, you'll be able to get to the finish line. And it sounds like that's pretty much what you guys did. Now, just to give a little bit of a background for you guys that are unfamiliar with the FFPC, these are where people play season long leagues, high stake leagues. I believe the buy-ins go up to what's the highest buy-in you guys uh, have available. We have a $10,000 league right now. That's the highest one. Is it just one of those? It's just one. Yeah. We have several, several 5,000. We have several 3,000 and it goes down from there. Our main event uh, is a $1,900 buy-in and Last year, we had uh, 2,400 teams in that one. So the high stakes games are prominent on our platform for sure. Yeah, the, you guys are pretty much the, I would say, go-to for what I know in the industry. You know, when I hear like high stakes fantasy football leagues, I immediately think of FFPC. What would be an interesting idea for you guys to do is if, you know, and this is whether or not it's a big part of your business plan to try to increase those high buy-in things as like a, a main stay of what you guys offer as a service, you guys should get like a celebrity league going on there where the buy-ins are, you know, really, really big. And so that you bring in like all these audiences to kind of watch the league play out, whether it's like football player, well, I guess it can't be football players, but like basketball players or actors or whatever it is. If you guys have the connections to get in touch with people, have you guys ever th have thought about doing something like that? Yeah, many times over the years, we've had some opportunities, some discussions and some, you know, we were brainstorming about, you know, let's do a million dollar league. We talked to even people kind of in Hollywood. So, you know, quote unquote in Hollywood, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how, you know, how much they were in Hollywood, but the, at least they claim they were do various shows and things like that. So, yeah, those those uh, conversations we've had on and off for years and years and years, uh, none of them materialized into anything. Uh, but in the meantime, we just kept growing our, our, our brand and, and our contest. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Because I remember uh, Sleeper, the Sleeper app did something like this last year where they, they brought in the fantasy footballers to do a league on there. But then they also brought in like Carl Anthony Towns and Zac Efron and all these celebrities and like high profile people. And I'm sure that that brought so much attention because just the live stream of that draft was you know 50,000 people watching they're like oh what's this platform and they get a bunch of signups like that you guys have a, a full-time team of four people uh, we have five now our team page may not be updated we hired a few years ago actually we hired a compliance officer due to the regulatory uh, environment that we have to deal with we hired someone uh, who who's now a full-time compliance officer and also helps in other aspects of the business but it 
yeah, it's uh, five full time, and then we have uh, dozens of seasonal seasonal uh, employees that we also hire as well. Okay, interesting. So for that compliance officer, I imagine the legal side. When you guys started up, I said that the tech issue might be, you know, probably one of the more difficult things to deal with. Did you guys try to make a website, do a league, and then like get shut down within a month when they figured out that you were like having people pay for the leagues, or was it more like? you guys were just organizing sort of an underground thing where, you know, we got our first 12 people in the league and it's like, you PayPal him, you Venmo, obviously Venmo wasn't a thing at the time, but you Venmo him, you PayPal him. Was it like that? Or did you guys have something set up that was more organized and like immediately got, you know, a cease and desist letter or something like that? Well, yeah. So fantasy football actually had a, um, it, it, it was, um, it had a, federal carve out in in the anti-gambling uh, legislature of 2006 the UEJA as ever, probably most people uh, know what UEJA is uh, but there, and there was a carve out in in for the fantasy sports which um, everyone who was launching fantasy products kind of used as their you know the pretense for them being a legal entity which we did as well so no we did not expect to get shut down but that was that thought was always in the back of our minds that yeah someone's going to knock on our door and shut us down but the funny part about that is one of the last things that we thought about was how we were going to process uh payment and uh i started trying to get you know v, v's uh, merchant a merchant account and we were kept getting denied because i was like oh no gambling sorry that's not going to work um, and so it took a while to actually get Visa, MasterCard, and American Express set up, you know, which was kind of a difficult part and totally overlooked by us at the time. Yeah. So, I mean, speaking on that, I feel like we could probably dive in a little bit more in depth. I talked with Scott Fish about this um, briefly when I had him on because he runs the safe leagues over there on the Sports, Sports Hub Game Network. I think I said that correctly. But he was saying, how you know, the process in order to get like legally paid uh, leagues onto a website and have that up and running by itself is, you know, a very difficult one. So you just said like, you know, getting the process with like Visa and MasterCard and stuff was one of the obstacles, but you guys, it, it, is there more pieces to that? Like, do you have to have some kind of, is there something else to it besides just getting on with the credit card companies? Well, again, back in 2008 it was very different. And for years we operated in, in an environment where it was kind of self-regulatory, really. Um, but it's not like you were grandfathered in. As soon as the law changed, you'd have to comply with that, correct? Uh, whenever the law changed, you have to comply, correct. There was no grandfathering uh, oh. of anything, yeah. Um, uh, so when laws did start changing in 2015, that, that's when really the, you know, that's when everything hit the fan, right? But before, prior to 2015, we operated uh, in a completely self uh, regular environment. We, you know, I mean, obviously we couldn't, you know, if you steal money, you know, you, if you embezzle money, you embezzle money. That's, that, that's, that's a <laughs> yeah. different issue. Um, but, uh, but there was no rules. There was no uh, rules as far as consumer protection. There were no rules as how to protect prizes and things of that nature. We actually made our own rules. Like we escrowed prizes back when no one told us to. And, you know, we did things that uh, we thought was a good idea to do even before we were required to do them. Yeah, so you guys kind of created the wave, and now most people, uh, most people end up riding it, which is which is pretty cool to be at the forefront of that in the industry. So things get a little bit choppy legally. Now let me let me ask you, like, how much would a company like yours, or just a company in general that needs to go through these legal hoops, what are the expenses like on a yearly basis in order to make sure that you're complying? I mean, you could throw in, you know, the the payment for the person that is the compliance officer within your company, plus any like legal and regulatory fees, because uh, coming from someone who would like, I would like to set up, you know, my own leagues on my website or something one day, but I almost feel like that's probably unrealistic given the amount of, you know, money that you probably have to pay to comply. Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, I think that's the major difference between uh, the industry now and the industry 10 or 20 years ago, where anyone could set up uh, a website, as long as they could, you know, figure out how to take payments. And as long as they figure out how to get um, get players to enter the leagues that's really all that that was important now um, the, the the cost of it, the, the cost of entry into the space is very prohibitive um, not just the actual in terms of dollars but in terms of man, man hours in terms of uh, regulatory items that you have to um, you know be compliant with 
uh, online, you know, just uh, geolocation and, and uh, know your customer or software. I mean, just a ton, a ton of stuff. And it's, and it's state by state. So this is not federal. This is not just one law that you have to comply with. This is a state by state issue. So certain states are more expensive than other, more uh, have more require, regulatory demands than others. And, and a lot of them are different. They vary state by state uh, with certain items. So you're paying fees. You're basically paying fees for whatever, like 30, whatever, however many are legal right now for you to do it in. Yeah. So That's about, wild. about 10 States, about 10, we are licensed in about 10 States, uh, which, which, uh, have some sort of registration, uh, and taxation and, you know, compliance and most, mostly with, uh, the gaming commissions, by the way. So you're, you're not dealing with some, like just some dude in some office. I mean, you're dealing with gaming commissions, just like casinos are. Right. right. So think about that, like fantasy football dealing with gaming commissions. It's not it's not that easy. So 10 states um, that we have licenses with uh, and then about 30 states that are kind of like in the in the gray area right now, which don't have anything on the books, um, but may at any point in time. And then there are 10 states that we cannot operate in due to either us not being licensed in those states at the time, for example, Indiana and Tennessee are two states that we can be licensed in, but are not due to the, the prohibitive costs uh, of those particular licenses. What do those licenses cost? Uh, so Indiana, for example, uh, it's a $50,000 registration fee uh, and then $5,000 every year. Jeez. Um, so again, this is just one state. Keep in mind, right. this is just one state, and this is not a big state, right? This is not Texas or Florida or New York. Uh, so, so this is Indiana. You know, with all due respect, Indiana, it's really not a top ten uh, populated states, and to have to pay fifty thousand dollars. Now, keep in mind that that does not count any other cost uh, that I mentioned, the compliance elements, right? That you have to build, whether you have to develop them, whether you have to follow them. You know, like I said, I have a compliance officer full time who I'm paying a salary for. So overall, I mean, to answer your previous question, as far as how much it costs, it's a very difficult. To, yeah, yeah, it's very difficult to put your finger on because it has to do with state by state. And then on top of the registration costs, you have taxes. And most people don't realize that we have to pay taxes on the, the kind of the, what we call it adjusted gross revenue. So that's entry fees minus prizes. So if we take in, let's say, $1,000 in entry fees, we pay out $850 in prizes. The adjusted gross revenue is $150. Bucks. That's what we taxes. earn, right? On top of that $150, out of that $150, we have to pay certain states, certain percentage based on the amount of people that are in those states. That's before we paid uh, rent. That's before we paid for development. That's before we paid salary. That's before we pay ta taxes to to the you know to the state and local government. I'm talking about in uh, income taxes. So this whole thing is just <laughs> it's a wild, wild. wild you Alex wild, sitting wild. over there like, honestly, this is not a great business uh, idea. Maybe we should shut it down. <laughs> That's no, crazy. No, it's crazy, but you know we've been over the years because we had such a nice such a nice. Um, uh, you know, we were in business for eight years when all this started happening in 2015 we're able to slowly adjust and, and we slowly, you know, the, we, we slowly entered certain states that were not as cost prohibitive as others. For example, Indiana that I mentioned, uh, but eventually like we will be in Indiana only because, you know, we, we're not, may not be able to right now, but we probably will be in the next couple of years. Do you, do you say that because once they tighten up their regulatory stuff, that price will come down or the fact that like, that's an investment that you guys will be willing to make in a couple of years? Yes, that's an investment that we will be willing to make in a couple of years. So right now you're, you're licensed in 10 states. Does that mean everyone that plays on FFPC has to reside within one of those 10 states or maybe some of the middle ground, the gray areas as well? Yeah, so it's 40 total states that, that, we're, that we are okay. taking entries from. 10 of them are licensed. 30 of them are kind of unregulatory, so to speak. But you know, just for your listeners so they understand, when you are licensed in one state and you are compliant in one state, you are, you're basically compliant everywhere. That's kind of how okay. it works. So if I'm, you know, if, if I'm, if I have a license in New Jersey and Pennsylvania and New York, which we do, that means that, you know, I have to be, you know, I can't do something illegal or, uh, or, you know, 
you know, against the law in, uh, you know, Utah. You know, I have to be compliant right. because I am a licensed operator in, you know, in those other states. Yeah. So I guess like projecting forward while it makes things really messy up front and trying to stay, you know, on top of all the, the changing rules and stuff, you can also look at that on the bright side and say, you know, there's an opportunity here because we're missing out on 10, 12, whatever amount of states it is. And eventually we'll be able to get those, those players onto our platform, right? Is that how you guys look at it too? Yeah, that's how we look at it. There are, I think, four states right now that are, no one is allowed to uh, take uh, fantasy entries from, including DraftKings and FanDuel, uh, I think Arizona, Louis, uh, Louisiana, um, and a couple of others, uh, Montana may be one of them. Um, so, but, but yeah, the re- yeah, we could probably get close to like 46, 47 states. Okay. So let me ask you if, if you're comfortable answering this, like where does the majority of the profit come in through? Is it from that, the little bit of rake that you guys take from those leagues? Is it through advertisers or like things like that? Because obviously you said, you know, thousand dollar buying, you're paying out 850, you got to pay taxes on the 150. It's like, clearly that's not going to keep the lights on there. Like where, um, where do you guys look to profit otherwise? Yeah, no, it, it has to keep the lights on. Uh, that's it just pure. Uh, vo- it's just pure volume then on leagues. It's a, yeah, it's a volume play. So it's a volume play and and running a lean business. Um, you know, not, and, which is something that we've always done. Like we, you know, we never we don't have investors. We've we've you know we we have no uh, liability. You know, we have no loans to pay. But you know, never taken investment money. Never love that. Never. And. Um, but we always made sure not to get uh, to get a, a, you know to get ahead of our ski, skis, so to speak, and and uh, you know we we never spent more than we thought we could um, uh, we could pay for, and so that's that's kind of what what we do. We we uh, it's a very lean yeah it's a very lean operation because it has to be to survive. That's yeah that's pretty wild. Um, I'd imagine that <laughs> that lends itself to a lot of stress and anxiety are there any are there any like specific times throughout maybe the 10 years 12 years whatever that you guys have been running this business where it got to the point where you're like eh, i don't know if we can actually keep this up is there anything like specific off the top of your head that you can like point to or remember no actually we've been lucky with that um you know we've been lucky in a sense that the business continued to grow and uh you know we've um you know we've we've made the right projections in terms of our, our, our spend, our, our spend and our guaranteed prize pools, you know, cause those are things that have to be guaranteed, um, ahead of time, uh, before the contest is launched. So, you know, we've never guaranteed prizes that we couldn't meet, uh, or didn't, didn't think that we could, uh, get enough entries to meet. Uh, let's put it this way. That's very important. Projecting prizes, you know, overlay is a, is a, is a, a word that everyone loves in the fantasy industry, <laughs> but it's really for a small operator. Maybe it's good for DraftKings, uh, FanDuel, and DraftKings because it gets them, uh, uh, you know, people to enter the contest, and um, it's a marketing tool. But it, for small business operators like us, overlay is death. So we've we've never had to deal with that. We've always been kind of wise in, in terms of how we project our our entries. Yeah, wait, let me let me ask you something on, on the projection level, because this is a, a personal question that I'd like to kind of know more about. When I'm going year to year and trying to project like how much I'll bring in through affiliates or how much my draft guide will sell, et cetera, et cetera. I look at it like, you know, there's an upper limit, of course, there's an, uh, a lower limit, of course, for business projections, money wise, I always project worst case scenario. And I'm not, I, I try to be as practical and realistic as I possibly can. Cause if you project worst case scenario and you operate based on that worst case scenario, obviously you'll, you'll be okay for the upcoming year. But if you start to project yourself to do better and it, it's tough because for me personally, like my audience grows almost exponentially each summer. So it's like, yes, I want to project my revenue to continue to grow exponentially each summer too. But that puts you in a, uh, sort of scary place. Because again, if you start to project at the higher limits of it, even though I think it's realistic and definitely possible for me to start projecting myself at that upper limit, it still can put you in a very vulnerable place. So when you guys are projecting, like, do you have like algorithms or are you just basing it more on, you know, looking at last year's numbers and saying, okay, this is, you know, our growth for the last five years has been an average of 1.2 X the number of leagues, or can you dive into that a little more? Yeah. Um, so my partner and I, we spend a ton of time on this. This is, it's actually a fun uh, topic to, for us. So we, we, we don't, no, we don't use algorithms per se, but we certainly use 
um, you know, use uh, spreadsheets and things of that nature. But it's mostly um, going based on our gut feel. I mean, you know, we look at what we did last year. We look at what natural growth, as we call it, should be. We look at our potential uh, growth due to certain aspects of, you know, it, it, us adding maybe new strategic partners or increasing the, the, the pool, so, the size of the prize pool, uh, that that could add to the growth. Um, so so we, we, we try to put all that together um, when projecting our prizes. And we can't undercut that and we can't, you know, we have to be careful. So we don't want to go too low. We don't want to go too high. If it's too low, uh, we can't raise it, right? So if, if, you know, we have to set a cap for, for the main event, right? We have to set a capacity. So the capacity, we can't increase. Uh, if, if sometime in August, we're like, oh, man, we're too low. You know, we're going to sell this thing out too early. Uh, and then we, we don't obviously don't want to go too high because then if we don't hit those numbers, then you got that scary word overlay, right? So, so we, we, we have to uh, be really thoughtful in how we do it. And we've always had a pretty good uh, time, a fun time doing it. And we've always been kind of uh, on point with our projections. Yeah, that's, uh, it's impressive. It, it's tricky during with our industry because it is seasonal. It does grow really, really fast. Yeah, just our industry as a whole has been growing year over year so quickly. I mean, and eventually it's going to come to a halt and eventually businesses will, you know, there will be a lot of businesses and there will be more competitors for every business out there. And, you know, projections will have to probably start to come down a little bit. But for right now, I think things are good, you know, industry or economy aside with the whole Corona thing, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's always been a, a tricky thing for me because I'm, I'm pretty new to having to project based on the numbers and stuff. So you guys are operating in most of the states. And one way that you can ensure that these leagues run through is by doing these live events. Uh, I'm super interested in hearing, I guess, you know, how it started. You, you kind of touched on that already. Like you had already been doing it and then you turned it into your own event in a sense. Uh, now, I, I, I want to kind of put this out there for the audience, for people that may not have seen uh, this piece of content or what I've done. So for the last two years, this summer, uh, if we are still allowed to do this, we've put together a, uh, a live draft. I put together a live draft with my audience where I've had uh, 11 or 10 subscribers from my YouTube channel fly out to New York. I'm based in Manhattan. And they're from all over the country. So last year, I think we had three Californians. We had like Detroit, Virginia, uh, Michigan, like all over the all over the place. They come out, and these people they they pay a lot of money to come for the weekend. Basically, we rent an Airbnb. It's like a baller place. We all crash there from Friday through Sunday. We hang out. We have a live draft on Saturday. Uh, we go out, and we just have a really, 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 really good time. And uh, it's a ton of fun. And one thing I've learned very quickly is that live of this probably the thing that I'm most proud of being able to have organized this and make this a yearly recurrence, but it's probably the most difficult thing I've ever done. It's especially the first year when I was doing it completely on my own, the logistics behind figuring out a live event were so difficult, especially with a larger number of people. So when you guys have this event where, you know, there's we only had 12 or 13 people all together in the house. So I can only imagine when it gets to the upper limits of 50, a hundred, a hundred plus people, like there's probably some madness that goes on behind the scenes. So give us a, a quick breakdown of what you guys, um, I guess had planned for and what this has turned into and, you know, some of the most difficult parts from it. Sure. Uh, well, the last few years, um, we had close to 900 guests. Uh, in Las Vegas on a yearly basis. This is this includes um, not just participants necessarily, but just you know everyone who kind of comes, maybe their families or their friends. Um, I would say so um, close to 900 people that we uh, that we are aware of that come to our events. Um, but th by the way, this is this is the part that I take care of uh, from. From a business perspective, I handle this so so I could speak to it probably better than maybe some other aspects. So this is it's definitely the, the funnest part um, of of running the FFPC is, ha is the live events in Las Vegas. It's actually a really small part of our business, uh, believe it or not. Only you know I don't know five three three to five percent of our drafts uh, uh, are held in Las Vegas. I was going to say, like, even I, I don't think the, pro the profit margin on it is fucking is miserable, at least from what I've learned over the last couple of years. Yeah. And, and 
I'll say this out loud here, but I usually I don't say this out loud is, um, you know, if the live events ever to go away, it, it wouldn't, for me, it would be a hell of a lot less work. And, you know, we, we probably, you know, overall, we, it, we may be break even on the entire operation in Las Vegas. So it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. I was yeah. going to say last year, I think, I think I legitimately lost about like revenue wise, we probably bought it, brought in about 15 grand, but yeah. profit wise, I think I, I had to take like $40 out of my wallet. I think that was it. But now I look at it as way more of a, it's, it's like probably my most popular video. Like we vlogged the entire weekend and it's probably my most popular video on my YouTube channel. It's like the trailer on my channel. It, it encapsulates everything I want people to know about my brand. So I use it as, as, as that, just a branding piece and a piece of marketing for people to understand, you know, what we are and what we offer as a company and as a brand. So I don't, I quickly learned after the first year, I'm like, we're not making profit off this. Let's just have a really fun time. Yeah. Well, so for us, it's very similar. If you speak to, to any of the uh, players that have been coming to our live events, whether, you know, they've been coming for two years or, or 12 years and we have lifers. I mean, we have, People who have started with us in 2008 um, and have been coming every every single year, you know, through the hurricanes, through the various issues that we've had, um, and they still they're still coming. Uh, it is they will tell you that it's probably the other outside of family. Uh, it's the single uh, it's the single most important event that they'll look forward to of their year. Uh, so so while while yeah, it, it may be economically. Uh, mm -hmm. better not to have it. Uh, I couldn't imagine uh, not having it for, for those people uh, because they enjoy it so much. And I enjoy it so much because I get to shake hands with all these people. And by the way, I get to hear thank you for running the FFPC told to me about a hundred times, which is pretty mm -hmm. amazing when your customers come over to you, shake your hands and, and say, hey, thanks for doing this. And I'm like, you're my customer. You're giving me money and I'm <laughs> thanking you. But they thank me, which is really, it's just unbelievable. And year after year, it just continues to happen. Um, so it is so much fun. Yeah, I, I put it together. It's, it's, uh, it's in Planet Hollywood. It's been in Planet Hollywood for the last uh, several years. Uh, we, we have a giant ballroom. We, we have a Thursday uh, game viewing party with like 400 people. Uh, you know, with giant screen, you know, the whole thing. I mean, it, it's so much fun. And we have a Sunday viewing party. Uh, we have about 70 drafts over the course of the weekend. So this remember, this is uh, NFL opening week. So it starts, the draft start on Thursday, uh, uh, heading into the Thursday game. And then we have drafts ongoing the entire Friday and Saturday. And then Sunday, as we like to say, uh, actually, as, a, as a, 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 a customer of mine, said years and years ago said Sundays when we open our Christmas presents. So, <laughs> so I always use that. Um, I always use that term, but yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely the, 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 you know, the best, the best weekend of the year for, for, for me and for a lot of my customers. Yeah. It's, it's one of the most fun weekends I have all year, like business wise, but just in general, like I, I love that weekend and like those dudes that come out to the draft and we've had, I think maybe seven or eight people that came the first year came back for the second year. And I feel like we'll probably have the exact same league again. And I want to keep it small. At first I was like, what if I do this multiple weekends uh, in August, we do it like two or three weekends in a row. And I'm just like, I don't, I don't, I realize like, I don't have that in me because we, you know, we just do like a very typical weekend in Manhattan where we're out, you know, Friday night, Saturday night, really late. And like, we're, we're basically like kind of partying the whole weekend. And I'm like, I can't do this for like three or four weekends in a row in August. Cause that's like really, you know, the time when I need to be on top of shit and making sure that my content is primo because that's peak season for fantasy football. So I was like, you know what, we'll keep this to one weekend. And I I've, I've really come to the terms with it. it's, it's like the best thing for branding is having these live events. So if you're a brand or a company out there that has not had a live event yet, I wouldn't jump into it right away and think that it's going to be successful because there are a lot of loopholes to get through. But it's one of, uh, I, I got to hear um, this, this lady, uh, I can't, I forget her name. She's the CEO of this, of this company called Boss Babe. And she was talking about building an online audience. And she's like, realistically, the point of building an online audience should be to bring them offline is to bring them together in person and have that connection because there's nothing stronger than the connection that you get with people in real life. And I mean, you and me just talking about it right now, it's, it's clear to see that, you know, those guys are like my brothers now, the ones that are in that league and like, they're almost like a family to me. So that kind of stuff is so important and it, it builds like this level of depth within your brand that, you know, that, that just is, is something that can't be attained just through 
um, just through like being online. So live events are, are extremely powerful tools. And I would, I would highly suggest trying to organize it based around whatever kind of like value that you bring um, to your audience. So live events are fun. <sighs> Gambling is fun. Fantasy is fun. The coronavirus is not fun, but this is a very real, 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 real possibility that the NFL season does get um, postponed, does get fully canceled. And if you are a creator, if you are a business, if you are anyone within the fantasy football space, we've actually been fortunate to the fact that, you know, we are not people that cover fantasy baseball or cover fantasy basketball. Otherwise this would have been a monster problem to us right now. I think a lot of us are, you know, in the back of our mind, we're feeling this sense of uneasiness, knowing that it's a possibility that this happens, but it, I mean, it's definitely a real thing because we'll probably be in lockdown for the next month, two months, three months, and they're going to start pushing back training camp. They're going to start canceling OTAs. Everything is getting pushed back. So with that being said, you know, maybe you guys have had some initial conversations about what's going to happen if that happens. Um, I know I've been just thinking about it. I haven't really put anything into practice yet. It's something that I will start taking a little bit more seriously as we get closer to the summer. But I just want to just from like a person to person standpoint, what are your initial thoughts? Like, what are your initial worries and like kind of just a, a initial things popping into your head when you think of the possibility that Corona will completely wipe out the NFL season? Well, that's the ultimate worry, right? Because if there's for us, uh, for us, if there is no NFL season, there are, there's no business, there's no profits. Uh, there's no way to cover uh, the cost of doing business uh, to, to, you know, to pay people's salaries. And when I say that, um, I don't mean that we can't pay them. I just mean that we can't pay them from the revenue that we are generating. Um, so we are paying that. We're paying all our costs uh, because we're a profitable business and we've been, we've been able to, uh, you know, we're, we're financially solid from the previous years to sustain a, a year where there is no NFL. But we certainly don't want it. And it's no. certainly going to be very tough. Uh, so that's the ultimate uh, problem. If the season is delayed, uh, as long as there is an official season, I think that that will be all right. I think everyone else will be okay. Uh, who's, um, you know, uh, ba whose business is based around the NFL, but we need that. We need an official season, whether it's eight weeks or 12 weeks or, or 16 weeks, we need that uh, official season. Yeah, we need something out of there. But like, I mean, you guys operating from, as you said, a very lean business standpoint, you guys, you think that you guys will be fine throughout it, even if the NFL gets canceled? Oh yeah, we'd definitely be fine because uh, the most important thing is to have the 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 player funds uh, available, protected, right? Which we do. That's part of our that's part of our business model. We've done it since year one, and we do it now because it's part of our uh, regulatory um, requirements that we have to do. So if we have to refund every single person that has so far drafted, and we've had tons of drafts ongoing, we we do every single day. Um, we could do that today and that you know that comes out of a separate uh prize pool uh a separate fund which does not affect us whatsoever uh as far as you know just sustain you know go getting through the year uh you know that's something that we have to do i mean we have to pay for it out of pocket that's that's what my partner and i will have to do and we will uh because you know we've been profitable and and I, I don't know, I don't know what others are going to do, honestly, especially missing, missing the uh, NBA, missing MLB and, and everything like that. I mean, not everyone has, has a billion dollar in venture capital investment like FanDuel and DraftKings, or not everyone's a publicly traded company like Yahoo. I don't know what those little guys are going to do. I, honestly, it, it's, you know, little, little guys like us, I guess. I don't know what they're going to do uh, because if they are, it, you know, maybe they were not profitable, let's say, going into this year. Maybe they weren't profitable for a couple of years. You're done. You're done. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how they're going to survive. You know, we've been profitable since year two. So we, we have a little bit, you know, we have a little bit of capital saved up for an emergency like this, although, of course, we never expected it. Yeah, I mean, you got to feel for the people that are either creating or running businesses based on the other sports because they had no choice at this point. But I'm with you. I think that, um, you know, I'm only 27. So it's not like I've been around in business and operating through different types of economies and stuff. But for the most part, the last whatever, five, 10 years has been very good. Uh, I think from an economic standpoint, and what this is going to do is exactly that it, it, it's going to start wiping out and clearing out a lot of the brands and the businesses that were 
I don't want to say like fake succeeding, but the ones that were just not succeeding, the ones that really weren't, the ones that didn't build a strong foundation, the ones that weren't operationally sound will start to kind of fade away, you know, one by one. Um, and obviously no fault to their own, but these are things that are going to happen in our lifetime and you have to have some kind of contingency plan. So I guess, you know, for you guys, it's kind of just bootstrapping and just saying, fuck it, we're going to get through this because we can, we'll refund our customers. Have you guys thought of anything like uh, tactically in terms of like, you know, reaching out to all the customers and saying, you know, we could refund your money or we could have you guys, you know, if you want to keep your money in the escrow, we can give you a ticket uh, or like double the, you know, keep your money here. We'll give you a second free draft next year or something like that, just to have the capital on hand. Well, any, uh, anything that's left in the FFPC account by any of our customers is protected, right? So whether they, we, when, when I say refund, the money will be refunded back into their FFPC account, and then they can withdraw it if they so choose. We're fine with either way, because if we, they, withdraw, they withdraw that money, we'll send them the cash, not a problem. If they leave it in the FFPC account, that money is protected. All our customers know that, and that's going to roll over into next year. Um, oh, so you don't, you, basically you're saying you don't even have access to that capital if you wanted to offer them like next year's the entry fee or something. No, we just, you know, that's not something that, that's not something we, we need to do. I mean, maybe we'll, we'll think about some promo like that, uh, but it's not something we need to do to kind of hold on to their money. I mean, that's, that's not really what, what our goal, goal is. Our goal is to just make sure our customers are comfortable with whatever the decision they're making, but they know that if they leave their money in FFPC accounts, um, that that money is totally protect, protected. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned like we need to have some sort of season and I'm with you, man. If we have, at this point, if someone came up to me and said, you know, take it or leave it an eight game NFL season starting in October, I'm, I'm smashing the accept button. Like give me any kind of football because for me, for creating content through the last, you know, through August, September, even into October, if I can continue to do so, that's great for me. Like I don't really care how long the NFL season is from a business perspective. Obviously I would love to see 16 games, but I mean, this is a real economic threat to any kind of small business out there. I, I'm, I'm curious just from, um, I guess a development standpoint, like if there is a shortened season, Mm -hmm. uh, what do you guys do on the back end when I'm like, technically speaking, do you guys have to order develop? Cause you have so many leagues set up and I'm sure like most of this stuff is kind of automated, you know, duplicating league settings and things like that. So would you have to have someone go in and like do a, a shit ton of, um, operating within all the leagues and stuff to, to make sure that it's set up correctly? Well, we, ha we have a, um, it's a third party, but they're, they're kind of like an in-house, uh, dev team that are okay. working on our stuff daily. So uh, that's something that we haven't yet discussed with them, but uh, Dave and I, my partner and I, we've discussed uh, the, the possibilities of a shortened season. And what we feel is, um, you know, we're going to have to adjust our formats to fit that shortened season. So, the, you know, if, it's, you know if, a, if, a, if a game format has a regular season, playoffs and championship round or whatever, you, you know, it will have to work within whatever the length of the season uh, that the NFL is going to offer us. And that's kind of what we're doing. We're just, you know, we're not listening to, uh, I, I mean, I'm listening to all the, I mean, I'm listening to the president, I'm listening to the governor, I'm listening to everything, but that's not what we're basing our decision-making on. Uh, we're watching the NFL and we're listening to what the NFL is saying and the clues right. they're giving us. That's the most important thing because those people are really paying attention as much as we're paying attention you know, they have a $9 billion business to uh, industry to protect, right? So they are really dialed in as far as how they're going to handle this going forward as far as delaying or, you know, possibly canceling. So what, you know, all the clues they're going to give us is going to give us uh, early warning as far as what we need to do. That's what I'm saying. There are people coming out and just saying like out of the woodworks, like I would be shocked if we had any sort of NFL season. And it's like, if the NFL thought that way they would not first of all they wouldn't keep the draft on at the end of April they would at least push it back and continue to see the you know developments unfold and then pick a date for it so with the NFL like the business the money is just too large to the point where I don't see them not figuring out a way even if it's completely fanless stadiums an eight game season Great. with no fans in the stadium we will have probably testing kits by then that can do it within 30 minutes, test the players three hours before the game. If everyone's positive, we could play the games. Obviously there's way more behind the scenes than just simply putting it that way. But I'm sure within the five or six month period, this is literally their number one concern. And when you have $10 billion and pushing that towards one concern, you could probably figure out one alternative way to make it happen. So 
I'm going to be optimistic for the time being until, like you said, we hear something more from the NFL that would make us more pessimistic. So uh, enough of the pessimistic stuff. Let's, let's get back to maybe talking about the growth of the business, some positive things. Now, when, when I'm like scouring your website and uh, I, was, I was excited because I always do like, you know, I, I find the person that we're going to bring on and then I start to do a lot of initial research on, you know, not only the person, their background, but the company they work for. And I, I really, uh, I appreciate what you guys stand for. Basically everything that's on your website, your about me, you know, questions, FAQ is always customer first. It's always like, we want to, I, I believe your like slogan is basically like, we want to treat our audiences, our, our, our customers like kings, right? And if you operate everything around that, if that's your core value and everything else follows suit, like that is how you build a strong foundation. If that's really what you guys are about, you guys will be fine in the long run. So when we're talking about, you know, like the core values, I, I think you guys have it right. I want to talk about innovation though. I want to talk about how you guys continue to grow the platform because in our industry, which is seasonal, it has a natural growth pattern to it. Each summer, there are going to be more people coming on. There are going to be more people joining your platform, more people interested in fantasy as a whole, but that also brings in more competitors to you guys and more, you know, content creators that are competing with me. So in order to continue to grow, you need some sort of innovation within your business. Now, you guys have done a lot, whether it's adding those high stakes, five to 10K leagues, doing the live drafts, you know, uh, having the website set up really nicely and aesthetically, uh, adding native content like the podcast that you guys have, adding the, uh, the mobile app. I want to talk about some of those things. Like what, what do you think you've seen from your perspective being um, one of the most like the, the highly contributing factors to the success of your growth and your innovation? Well, from a technical perspective, that's always like I told you, uh, you know, me, me being not, you know, technically non-savvy mm -hmm. whatsoever. But you have a feel for it as, as the owner, like you have a feel for what worked, right? Yeah, I have a feel for what worked, but I know that that's our weakest point. So I know that that's something because it's not something I could fix or I could work on myself. And, be, and believe me, if I, if I had that skill set, uh, that's all I would be doing. And, and my partner uh, would probably say the same. We, sometimes we answer that to, to our customer when, when they ask us for some sort of enhancement, some sort of improvement. I, you know, listen, we have to depend. As good as our dev team is, we still have to depend on them. And they have a schedule. Right. And uh, I tell them, listen, if this is something I could do myself, it would be done yesterday. But I have to depend on someone else, and they have a different schedule than I do. So the most important thing is to continue improving our tech. That's where that's what we've been doing from uh, from day one, and uh, for for better or worse, that's what we we've always done, and we we know that's our weakest point. As far as innovation goes, honestly, I don't know if we're big innovators. What we want to do is just continue doing exactly what we want to what we have been doing and what's been working, because that drives that drives more. Uh, business to us, more customers, more players to us than anything else, which is them knowing that this is a trustworthy platform. They knowing that they're going to get a response to a customer service question within minutes, maybe hours. Um, them knowing that, you, you know, they, they, uh, they could count on a, uh, uh, an unbiased commissioner, let's say for dynasty teams, you know, we have a huge dynasty platform mm -hmm. and uh, you know, if you've ever run dynasty teams, or if you've ever been in dynasty teams, the biggest issue is, uh, is uh, trading and, you know, commissioner bias yeah. and all that stuff. I mean, we have over 500 dynasty teams up to $5,000 entry uh, that, that my partner, Dave is the commissioner of. So the reason why we have, he commissions all dynasty, those, huh? He commissions all those He commissions all every single one of them. Now he's not in every single league. Every right. He just day. make, he, he just solves, he gets the shitty part of it. He doesn't he actually get to play. He just, Damn. Absolutely. I don't wish that upon my worst dynasty. enemy. Yeah. So, so why is that? Why is the dynasty uh, format growing for us? Because people know. Because they tell their friends, "Hey, this format is great. You know, you 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 know you you get a you get a good uh, good deal from the commissioner. You know, he's going to make the right decisions, and everything will be taken care of." So for us, that's where that's. I don't know if it's innovation. I don't know. I I don't know what you call it, but that that's what we want to continue doing. And that has helped us grow, uh, grow the, the platform throughout. So um, our main event has been growing. Uh, the Football Guys Players Championship has been growing, which is our mid-stakes mid contest. You know, 
we have half a million dollar grand prizes, which is really unheard of in a season long uh, industry that's only been seen uh, regularly in the DFS space. You know, hopefully those are, will be million dollar prizes a, a few years from now, especially with the CBA resolved. And maybe this, if this coronavirus thing gets resolved this year without a cancellation of the season. So that's what we're looking for. You know, we're, that's where our innovation is. Continue what we're doing and grow and grow the, the, um, grow the prize pools. How seriously do you guys look at uh, content? Partnering with content creators or having your own uh, content, you know, that's owned by you guys? Yeah, so we've uh, kind of taken the approach that we're going to stay out of content uh, altogether. And we're going to let our, you know, we're going to let, let our partners, the content partners and friends, really a lot of friends in the industry who are content providers, take care of that aspect of it. So um, we, don't, we don't offer content. Uh, content. We partner with, uh, uh, you know, ro- whether it's Rotoviz or Football Guys or, or Fantasy Alarm, Draft Sharks, mm-hmm. you name it. And I, I'm sorry, if, you know, if I'm leaving someone out, uh, I really don't mean to, but they have our API, they write articles about it, they write strategy, you know, to, they have put out strategy tools and so on and so forth. And we leave, we leave that aspect to them. That's not, our, that's not what we do well. That's what they do well. Okay. So you basically you're using like other influencers within the space to, you know, drive traffic to you guys via them. Yeah. It's, they drive traffic, but they also put out good content, which is, yeah. which, uh, which I think works for both of us. Yeah. I mean, I, I think putting out good content is in today's day and age, that is the way to drive good traffic because once you have the audience, you kind of have the leverage behind it. So um, I, I'm of the mindset that like, I think a lot of businesses should cut out the middleman in, you know, I was thinking about this actually yesterday and um, I I feel like once you have the audience or once you have that kind of leverage, you could almost start to sprout out and venture into other, uh, like for instance, okay. So say uh, my YouTube audience uh, grew to a hundred thousand people, right? And if tomorrow I wanted to, I, I look at the um, the products or the services offered within within our space, the fantasy industry, and I just started creating my own spin on them. Like for instance, I worked with a company called Fantasy Jocks for a long time. They offer uh, championship belts and rings and trophies, and they have uh, live draft boards that you put on the wall that if you're doing a live draft with your friends. But if I had amassed a, I could probably even do it now, but I don't know the production and the manufacturing behind it. But if I just started my own company and I started selling those things, I'm of the mindset that I would win. I would start to outsell them because I already have the loyalty and the audience um, that follow me and they trust me, right? So I'm thinking like long term, something like building the content is a way, like if I wanted to start my own FFPC, which would obviously, you know, that that's way harder said than done and with all the logistics behind it, um, like I think I could compete with a lot of players in the space or just content creators in general. Like if the fantasy footballers who have, you know, 200,000 followers everywhere, if they just started creating all the different kinds of products and services within the space, I'd imagine they would, they would have a monopoly. They'd have like this empire and start wiping out a lot of competitors. Do you, do you guys ever um, think of, think of it that way? Like wiping out the middleman? <laughs> no, no, not at all. No, Does that make they, sense though? Yeah. It, it you know, we've had some opportunities over the years to, to get into the content space, you know, to either become part, uh, you know, investors or to either to, to purchase an existing uh, content site, content mm-hmm. and new site. And we just, you know, that's just the, the I way think you we, should, I think you should, I think you should start taking content a little more seriously, man. I really do. Yeah. Well, you know what? It, we're, we're not good at it. Uh, we've never done it. So uh, I don't want to do something that I, I'm not, I'm not good at, uh, you know, also I, I know, I know I look kind of young, but I'm almost 52 years old. So, <laughs> well, yeah. I didn't mean you personally, but I mean like having someone on the team that does it, like, you're like, Oh, you're really good at content. Yeah. Let me, you know, yeah. bring you in and be our guy. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think there's some truth to that. Um, but you know, we, we, we honestly, we, we have such, such great friends and strategic partners in the industry that we kind of for, you know, whether it's the right decision or not, and I, and I understand what you're saying, but we've left it up to them. Um, and, and we try, try to do what we know uh, how to do. Yeah, I mean, you know, Twitter content, I mean, that's not content. It's, you know, putting nah. out tweets and this and that. That's just nonsense. I mean, yeah, it's social media. But um, no, we, we, we kind of uh, stick to what we know. 
Okay, fair. Yeah, I, I I really enjoy asking. Like, I love pushing the content onto like people or or businesses that don't do it often because it's like my favorite thing in the world. And they're just like, ah, you know, it's like ah, we don't really focus on that. We focus on what we do good, and it works for us. I'm always just like, you should be putting out more content and whatnot. So it's always a fun getting the the reactions from people. No, I, I agree, and I mean, look at the look at the big the big guys in the in the industry. You know, Fanduel and DraftKings. They, they got all do it. Contact. Yeah, they all do it. So. I'm not saying I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it is just not something that we're ready to do. Ourselves. What about what about the live event you guys do in Vegas? I've I've seen like bits and pieces of content that come out of there, but do you guys um, like ever think about really hiring a, like a full time video crew just for the weekend? Yeah, we hired a couple of kids who did who did some videos for us that you know uh, many many years ago. Um, we could probably do a much better job of it, uh, much more professional, but. To be honest with you, the events uh, themselves are, are not very fancy. So they're not very, they're not w, WSOP-esque, right? They don't have the big lights and the big glitter and the big what you need What you need to do is get a couple of the participants and give them, uh, give them like a $200 camera and let them, let them videotape their experience of the weekend. That's, that's what you guys need as content. That's a good, that's a good idea. Not that's too professional. Kind of, that's the kind of content I would, I would support for sure. Um, but, uh, but my point is, is the events themselves are not very, very flashy to, mm -hmm. to, to uh, you know, they're not very impressive necessarily, you know, uh, the way that when you watch, uh, let's say the NFL draft and, you know, you see this gigantic, you know, ballroom and all the, yeah. all the banners and everything like that. That's not what FFPC events are, are really about. It's really much more, there's a draft table, there's a bunch of people, a bunch of diehards just as crazy as you are. There's a draft board, go draft. And that's all they care about. That's so, yeah. The vlog style is, is what it is. Cause no one's going to have the production uh, quality that the NFL draft has. They sink millions and millions and millions right. into that. What you need to do is, is just have real authentic type of content. Someone that's who's good, really yeah. going to, yeah. You know what I mean? Like someone who, who, Oh, we just landed in Vegas. I'm about to go check into yeah. my hotel room. Like my nerves are going crazy. I see all the high stakes players, like, you know, something like that. Yeah. It's like, it's like when, you, when they leave the, uh, the little uh, disposable cameras at the wedding on the table, on the, uh, on each table, right? There's Those always come out the best, right? Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Good idea. So that, that's how you got to start thinking with that kind of content stuff. All right. So we've covered a lot of the big, uh, big topic things at the end of these interviews. I typically like to ask a few random questions to my guest. The first of which, are there any other creative endeavors that you could see yourself kind of diving into not sports related, not fantasy related one, three, five, 10, 20 years down the road? I haven't thought about it. Uh, you know, I, like I said, I'm almost 52 years old. I think, um, if I do exit the FFPC, which there are no plans currently, but at whatever point in time that happens, I think probably my next, you know, my, the next plan will be where, where to retire uh, that I could, uh, you know, go out for walks in the summer and ski in the winter. Uh, that's that's kind of what I want to do with okay. my life after the FFPC. Okay. Life after fantasy. Best purchase that you've made under $100. <laughs> So you you live in New York City and I live in New York City. What what the fuck can we buy for under hundred dollars? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a good answer. You can get you can get lunch somewhere. <laughs> exactly. Some, and sometimes you can't. By the way. Yeah. Facts. There's got to be something that you've purchased in your lifetime under a hundred dollars. You know, I actually uh, I just purchased something recently. I um. So uh, I'm not in New York City currently, as I told you before the interview. Uh, I'm I'm holding out in a in my condo in in Vermont. I broke my reading glasses, and that was that was the problem. So I actually went to a store and I bought uh, reading glasses for one dollar. I bought one dollar reading glasses. Here they are. What's the catch? There is no catch. They're one dollar. The, the catch is how they look. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just I'm kidding. <laughs> that's funny. No, they didn't. Uh, that's I, I been thought the best was... purchase that I could think of, in, at least in the last two weeks. Let's put it this way. Fair enough. You wouldn't be able to see me right now. That works. All right. Uh, last question. We need one very bold prediction from you about the future of the fantasy football industry. It could be literally anything. Well, I, I think I think the trend the last couple of years, especially after the gaming, gaming opening, oh, sports gaming opening, uh, I think the trend is – Prop betting has become the trend, and I could see that becoming something bigger. Take a con some sort of contest formats, so similar to like how we run our contest, where you, you know you have drafts and you have uh, entry fees and and prizes. 
maybe it'll be similar uh, similar type of contest. They may already ha may be happening now, or not now, but they may have been happening already. I just didn't notice uh, in 2019 season. But maybe prop related contests, week to week contests that take place over the entire season with you know giant grand prizes, just like you know we have with DraftKings and FanDuel and WSOP has. That's interesting. So like a long form version of like player prop bets, but you're competing in a league over the course of the 16 weeks. Yeah, maybe something like that. But I mean, pro anything prop related and, you know, the props are becoming more and more interesting and, and, and more, you know, just in, in, uh, in, what's, in what's the word I'm thinking of? Intriguing. Intri <laughs> yeah, intriguing. So, so yeah, there, I, I guess, um, you know, somebody will come up with some really great ideas on how to translate those into a contest format. If that yeah, happens. I think those are the most easily transferable from fantasy because, you know, with fantasy week in, week out, we're talking about stats and we're like, oh, this guy's going to pop off for 85 and two touchdowns. That's direct to player props. So yeah, player props. I'm not big on gambling. I don't gamble too often, but when I do, I love to hit the player props because I feel like I have an edge, even though I definitely don't. And I lose a lot of money to Vegas, but those are definitely the most transferable types of gambling things. So I could definitely see them getting a bit more popular as we head into the future. So that is going to wrap up this interview with my man, Alex over there. Uh, I want to give you a, a giant thank you for joining me during these tough times. I know you're uh, stuck out there in Vermont and this was probably a, a nice little break from from sitting in the room over there as well as it was for me and I hope the uh, audience out there really enjoyed this interview I got a ton of value from it so thank you for you know uh, expending your wisdom my way as well to the audience where can these people I guess if you want them to find you on social or if you just want them to head over to the website and check out what you guys have uh, going on over at FFPC plug your stuff Sure. The website is uh, myffpc.com, myffpc.com. And on Twitter, we're at FFPC. How long have you guys been trying to buy the FFPC uh, domain name? That's a great question. <laughs> they, so the FFPC don, don, domain name was owned by a farm, some sort of a farm product uh, retailer. And we've contacted him back in 2008 over the years, contacted him again. He finally went out of business. So the domain, it doesn't even exist. And we have no idea who to purchase it from. So there you have it. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to hear that. I hope you guys can get that domain name eventually. But if no one owns it, that means no one can charge you about $500,000 to buy it. No, I think the farm people still own it. They just, you know, I don't uh, know. Well, yeah. they need to. Uh, that's so yeah. odd. That's so annoying, man. Yeah. Someone took my name, like nickercolano.com, and I've been trying to contact them to, to get it back from them for like eight years now. I can't get it either. We got problems over here. I hope y'all don't have problems, though. So make sure that you hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We'll see you on next week's Business of Fantasy Football interview. Peace. All right, Nick. See ya. Hey, hey.